And it is my unique privilege and honor to introduce the speaker today, Palva Shakakar. Um, I'm going to read the highlights of her bio so that we can understand the scope and breadth of her work. Palvasha is the Interim Director for Religion and Inclusive Societies at the U.S. Institute of Peace, USIP. Kakar joined USIP after four years with the Asia Foundation, where she was the Afghanistan Director for Women's Empowerment Development. Prior to joining the foundation, Kakar led the Gender Mainstreaming and Civil Society Unit in the United Nations Development Programs, Afghanistan's Subnational Governance Program, managing a small grants program for Afghanistan's civil society initiatives. Kakar also served as the program manager for the Gender Studies Institute at Kabul University. She has experience working with the World Bank Group on gender, social justice, and environmental issues surrounding their various projects in the region. Kakar moved to Afghanistan to work with Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit, AREU, an independent research organization on women's participation at the local levels in the National Solidarity Program, NSP. Before moving to Afghanistan, she was the director of the Newton Peace Center, currently Peace Connections, a faith-based civil society organization. An Afghan American, she has experienced teaching and researching religion, gender, security, and local governance. Kakar has published research regarding women's participation in local governance, Pashtunwali Afghan customary law, Afghan women's identity, and, sports, and social spaces in Afghanistan. Her research has taken her to Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Egypt, Israel, Palestine, Jordan, and Syria. She earned her master's focusing on gender, politics, and religion from Harvard's Divinity School, and a bachelor's in religion and global studies focusing on peace and conflict from Bethel College in North Newton, Kansas. I welcome uh, Palvasha to this forum and invite her to begin her presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luna, for that kind inter um, introduction. Um, so I will start sharing my screen now. Um, let's see. Hopefully that works. All right. So thank you so much for this opportunity to speak today um, about 9-11 and the impact it's had on my own life, but also on the lives of those that I've worked with around the world. Um, and so I just want to begin with a caveat that this is more of a snapshot of my experiences um, and the women that I've encountered around the world than generally the impact of 9-11 um, on, on everybody. But let me start out with talking about the United States Institute of Peace, where I work. Um, I usually ask the audience when it's live, how many of you have heard of the United States Institute of Peace or have you ever seen the building? It's a beautiful building that sits at the corner of Constitution and 23rd Street at the end of the mall. Um, and it's established by Congress, by Congress in 1984 as a national nonpartisan and independent institute that's dedicated to the proposition of a world without conflict. Um, and with the idea that, that a world without conflict is both possible, practical, and is essential for US and global security. Um, uh, the building itself is a monument to peace and the work that we do shows the United States commitment to peace around the world. Um, so I'm just going to quickly uh, go through this slide. Like I said, our vision is a world without conflict. Um, and our mission is to prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflicts around the world. We do this both top down and bottom up. We do this through research. We do this through training and, and field programming to really try and build sustainable peace around the world. I personally work on the religion and inclusive societies team. And the religion and inclusive societies team is the oldest thematic team at the Institute. Um, it was established really early on uh, after the Institute was established. Um, initially, the Institute, as it was being established, was supported by religious communities that had advocated to Congress. And so religion was not something far away from the vision 
of the United States Institute of Peace. Um, and so when the United States Institute of Peace was formed, uh, there was research that started uh, quite soon looking at human rights and religion and the role of religion, particularly in the, um, in the breakup of the Soviet Union. And then after that, we continued with the work expanding, not just for in the realm of research, but doing actual engagement with religious communities on the ground, with religious actors on the ground uh, on peace building efforts. So it's not, it wasn't just looking at religion as a driver of conflict, but looking at religion as a resource for peace building and working with communities to support that. Many people ask me, you know, oh, are you working with the traditional clerics? And yes, we do sometimes work with the old men in the big hats. But the whole part of religion and inclusive societies is, means that we actually look, take a more inclusive approach. And we work with women, we work with youth, we work with those that mobilize around religion and our religious actors in general, and not just with uh, those that are clerics uh, in this field. So I'm often asked, why do I do what I do? And this will lead me into the impact that 9-11 has had on my life. So let me start with my story. Um, I grew up in uh, Seattle, Washington. I was born to a mother who was from the Midwest, from Iowa. My father's from Northern Afghanistan. And um, some people call me a Afghan since I'm half American, half Afghan. And in uh, 1989, when the Soviets were pulling out of Afghanistan, my family decided that they wanted to move back to Afghanistan. Both my parents were in the medical field and they felt that it was their duty to go back to Afghanistan and be of service to the people. And that was something that we had been raised with. We always had this expectation that once the, there was enough security in Afghanistan, we would move back. And so in 1989, we moved, but because of the civil war, we were not able to go into Afghanistan. We moved um, as far as we could to the closest area, which was on the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan to an area close to Peshawar. Um, and that's where I actually ended up uh, meeting my extended family, my uncles, my aunts, my cousins, and who were living in the refugee camp. And uh, they were living in refugee camps there in Shamshatu, which was outside of Peshawar, on the very close to the border of Afghanistan. Um, and it was in these refugee camps uh, that I first uh, encountered them and uh, really got to know my cousins. And I realized quickly that among all of my girl cousins, I was the only girl cousin going to school. And the refugee camps had schools, um, but my cousins were not allowed to go to school. So me being the cheeky American kid that you know, came uh, from the United States, I decided I was going to challenge my uncles about why they were not allowing their daughters to go to school. So I, I, well, at that time, I was 11 years old, and I went and talked to my uncles and said, why don't you allow them to go to school? There are schools that are available in, Afghan in the refugee camps. Um, that are girls only, and it would allow them to become doctors and teachers, which is what Afghanistan needs, and also, which would be good for their own economic development in the future, they'd be able to stand on their own uh, feet, they would be able to have an income, it didn't work, it didn't work for me to say anything about how it'd be good for the country, it'd be good for the family, none of that worked. It wasn't until I started talking about how in Islam, it was an imperative that they educate their daughters that the first words of the Quran were to read, to Iqra, and that uh, in Islam, there was a tradition of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that uh, you must educate your daughters. So all of these things, um, this framework that I started describing from an Islamic perspective, I started to see that there was changes in their thinking and that that started to slowly, slowly give them a different idea about the importance of girls' education. And so then I went to my parents and advocated for them to help me with this. And uh, with the help of my parents, we were able to convince uh, my uncles that they should allow their daughters to go to school. And so I'm happy to say that now I do have girl cousins who have been educated. Some of them are teachers. Some of them are on their way to become doctors. And uh, this really opened my eyes to the importance of how it, working within religious frameworks and describing women's rights and really sensitive topics within religious frameworks could open doors, not only for empowering girls, but also uh, for empowering um, all a myriad of voices um, for all kinds of issues related, not just to development, but also to peace building and bringing stability in countries and communities. So this was what I called my aha moment. Um, and so after this, uh, I went on to 
uh, college and uh, in, in Kansas, as was mentioned. And then I did my, um, I started to study at Harvard where I really wanted to, um, originally I had this idea that I would go back to Afghanistan and that I would be able to work in Afghanistan on some of these issues related to women's rights and doing culturally appropriate and religiously appropriate um, work. But uh, early on when I had started college, the Taliban took over in Afghanistan. And that sort of shattered my dreams for being able to go back because of the very conservative and closed uh, way that the country was going towards. And so when I did my master's, I, was, I had changed and, and my idea was to look at early Islam and the role women played in early Islam, but not so much focus on the, the development aspect. But um, when I was at Harvard starting my orientation and, and walking towards the orientation session, um, this is what I saw on the screens going towards orientation. Um, the Twin Towers had been hit that morning and I was in Boston and flights had left from Boston. And so people in my class were worried about their parents who had dropped them off if they had been on these flights. Um, cell phones weren't working. People, it was, there was just chaos um, among the students trying to figure out what was going on. Um, immediately, uh, the people who are running orientation said to stay calm and not to lay blame, blame on anyone. Um, but later, as it became clear and clear that this was done, by Muslims who were then labeled as Muslim terrorists, I became very apprehensive. Um, and so that day was really very shortened. Um, orientation didn't go forward. And from that day on, it was just very strictly be going to class when needed and going home. And that was it, no more interactions on campus. Um, what had happened the day after the attacks was there was a mob that was looking for students related to the bin Laden family um, on the Harvard campus. They had been flown out. People did not know that, but there were people who were going to um, try and, and, and lynch them. Um, on my way to school, I was spit upon. Uh, I was told to go home. Uh, why was I here? Um, I had uh, times where I felt that cars were about to hit me on the road. Um, I had friends who their bank accounts were frozen, who were students at Harvard, their bank accounts were frozen, their um, computers were taken away from them. One of my close friends who was in the same program as I was, she was in Harvard um, Square and her hijab was ripped off her head and they attempted to beat her um, for being a Muslim. It was not an easy time at all. Um, I had also, I also experienced when I was going to class, particularly at the Kennedy School, that people were trying to record me and everything that I was saying, I had to be very careful. I was told that I could not speak freely, that I should not question things that were happening, um, that it would, I would get in trouble if I said anything um, in public forums, questioning the government or what was happening. Um, so it was, it was a very difficult time to be a Muslim woman and to be wearing a hijab uh, openly at that time um, in Boston at Harvard uh, after 9-11, particularly those months. At the same time, many of our professors, our Muslim professors um, who um, were, you know, like my advisor, Leila Ahmed and those who were on campus, they were often um, called to be on television shows, called to be advisors and, and weren't around. So there was not as much of a support network as there could have been because of all that was, that was happening. And as I was hearing the rhetoric that was coming out of what was unfolding in Afghanistan, it wasn't just that we're going to bomb them back to the Stone Ages, but it was all of the, the language around, we have to go and save the Afghan women from the Taliban. And everything that I was hearing from that gave me this reaction that remind, as I remembered what the experiences I had and talking to my uncles, I knew that we couldn't go and say, you know, we're gonna come and change the world. We're gonna come and change the way you think about women's rights. That we had to do this again from a culturally appropriate and religious framework. And that's how it was going to be done effectively and sustainably in Afghanistan. And so I shifted my focus of my master's degree because I wanted to make sure that women's rights were being introduced in Afghanistan and being um, promoted in Afghanistan that uh, would not cause backlash. So I've worked on focusing on um, 
gender, religion, and politics and, and that intersection. And I quickly uh, was able to move to Afghanistan as soon as I finished my master's degree. And it was there in Afghanistan that I met incredible women doing courageous things doing courageous things for their country to build peace and stability, um, to contribute to uh, constitution building um, because of what had happened after 9-11 and the attacks and then the incoming PRTs that had brought in some stability to the country. Women were able to have much more mobility and were able to um, take on roles that they had taken in the past before the war where they were part of local councils making decisions. So you can see here in this picture, um, uh, one such woman in a local council with men. Um, granted, it wasn't, there wasn't more um, equal distribution, but there were women in, in these councils. And with the National Solidarity Program that I was doing research on, we saw more and more at the local level in the community development councils, women taking on leadership roles. Um, so not just being in councils, where on average in Afghanistan, at the village level, there was 30% women in these councils, but they were actually getting into more leadership positions. So I was just blown away at the amazing um, courage that the women had, but how much they were able to do in such a short amount of time in terms of being able to progress and find spaces for their voices and for action. Um, I wanted to add that at this time, uh, you know, the, the war on terror was not just about Afghanistan, obviously. Iraq was there. Um, we all, it also meant that uh, there were places like uh, Nigeria, where the Boko Haram were, that were um, targeted. Thing, things related to violent extremism uh, around the world were being targeted. So we had Libya uh, uh, that was um, also being targeted after the fall of Gaddafi, we had violent extremist groups growing up there, and then there was the war on terror and there were efforts there. And I met amazing courageous women in these countries as well. These are, this is Khadija and Zahra, Khadija's from Nigeria. She herself has done all kinds of negotiations at the local level, is a, is a sheikha herself, um, has done uh, not only negotiations, but also has been involved in various, um, activities in terms of building the nation and building uh, efforts within the local communities that build up to the national level um, in terms of bringing security to the country. And Zahra uh, is also one of those people that is connected to the local level and local peace building initiatives, but also bringing building platforms in Libya for women to be able to engage in constitution building and negotiating the new government um, and in peace building at various levels. So these are the types of women that we've seen uh, really be able to take on the challenge of violent extremism in their communities and really be able to engage uh, with them appropriately and build their countries out. In Afghanistan, there was a constitution that was drafted and passed in uh, 2004. Um, this was the Islamic Republic constitution. There was a series of commissions and it ended uh, by a lawyer Jericho where women participated. And the constitution ensured women's rights, access to education, healthcare jobs, life work balance, and quotas in parliament. Um, and women were actually elected beyond the quotas. So we have, uh, you know, women in, were at 27% in parliament, the upper house and the lower house. And compare that to um, Nepal in the region, which is the highest in the region, uh, where there's actually, um, Party, where it's by party seats. And so women get their certain seats of quota based on how many, um, based on how, how much uh, votes are given to those parties. So it's, it's a different system. And, and uh, in Afghanistan, they're much more independent. They were much more independent. Now, of course, this has all fallen apart with the Taliban government. Um, so the other thing I, I, I had touched upon earlier and I wanted to mention again was women um, in Afghanistan at the local level um, had been rising up. And, and it wasn't just in Afghanistan that they were rising up, but around the world. I was noticing that in Afghanistan, there were women who were negotiating with uh, local elements of the Taliban, where they were actually themselves going and negotiating the settlement of cases on behalf of the community, where there was asking the Taliban to move their checkpoints, release hostages, or release actual women. There was a story of a woman who um, who had eloped uh, and the family 
and then was captured by the Taliban and the family found out and, and ap appealed to one of the women elders in the community. And she herself went and negotiated the release of the Taliban. And she was a Quran teacher and Hadith teacher. So she very much framed what um, her, her advocacy to have the, the, the girl released through Islam and through how the family wants her and through forgiveness, but also through um, encouraging them to do the right thing according to Islam. And when I uh, heard of the stories and talked to these women in Afghanistan, and I started, uh, while I was at USIP, I started looking around at other countries. I noticed that this was not something unique to Afghanistan. We were seeing that women in countries around the world were doing this kind of work where they were engaging with um, violent extremists, uh, like I said, with Boko Haram, with Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria, uh, with uh, various elements, um, with al-Shabaab with all kinds of elements, uh, extremist elements. And it wasn't just even in Muslim countries. So yes, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, Nigeria, but it in Yemen, but it was also in countries like Myanmar where women were um, in, in negotiating with um, Buddhist extremists uh, in, um, in the Philippines, in Northern Ireland. There were all kinds of ways in which religious women were negotiating uh, with violent extremists and with those on the front lines. And so I started to develop a study where I was actually working to, and we're continuing to do this, to um, document the case studies and then work with the women themselves to develop curriculum and then do peer-to-peer -peer training um, of women around uh, the world. So uh, in this process, you can see, <laughs> this is a, a picture of one of these women um, uh, doing uh, herself um, making the prayer after a negotiated sell settlement. But we, we work on gathering evidence um, and it so far shows that the sustainability of peace building processes um, happen when religious actors are involved. And so it does increase sustainability when religious actors are involved. And, and really USIP has been a pioneer in developing this dimension of, of peace and um, looking at the dimension of religion in its work. Um, and we, we've been recognized as, as, as doing this kind of really investing in developing and understanding these stories. Um, another thing I wanted to highlight that it's not just the local level where we see women being very active and effective. It's also the national levels and, and nation building. So women are involved in all levels of peace process, peace building. Um, we can see here the, the national level of peace talks they're involved in, as I mentioned, they were involved in constitution drafting. They've been on national assemblies and parliaments. Um, and I've engaged with many of these women, not just in, um, in Afghanistan in that context, but also in other countries that have been uh, developing uh, uh, since 9-11 and after the Arab Spring. So like uh, Libya, um, Tunisia, um, and Morocco, and also those that are struggling in Syria with the peace process, the ongoing peace process right now. We've also seen that um, men, but also religious women um, have been in track one peace processes, but also influenced track one peace processes. Um, and so we've, we've been gathering more data to understand this dynamic and what roles that they actually have been able to play and uh, where they're effective and how we can actually build on some of the work that they've done um, across uh, around the world. So we have um, women in Sri Lanka here at the bottom of this, uh, Liberia um, and Afghanistan are some examples here. But I wanted to actually reflect uh, really quickly at the end of this presentation on what's happening in Afghanistan right now. So because the Biden administration decided um, that they would honor the previous agreement and pull out of Afghanistan and then the withdrawal date would be by uh, before September 11th, which ended up being August 31st. Um, there was a huge rush to evacuate uh, in a very unorganized way uh, those that had worked with the United States government, allies, and those that were in danger uh, with the Taliban takeover. And um, many women and children were part of this evacuation process, um, and it has taken a really great toll um, on those that have been evacuated and as well as those that have remained but tried to get through an evacuation process and are fearing for their lives in Afghanistan. Um, one thing I did want to mention was uh, uh, 
I heard from a, one of the psychologists who've been working with the um, Afghans who have coming, who've been coming through the evacuations. And she was saying on average, every single person has who's come through the evacuation have ex experienced at least four traumatic events through this evacuation process. So it's not been an easy process at all. And the toll on women and children, of course, um, is, is, is very strong. Um, women having special needs um, as well as something um, that needs to be taken into account. And finally, uh, currently in Afghanistan, women are continuing to protest the Taliban takeover. They are protesting um, the fact that they're not being given their rights according to Islam. They're framing it very much with an Islamic uh, uh, perspective and saying how important it is that they're allowed to go to work, that they're allowed to have an education. Um, there are schools that are, are starting to open, uh, but women have been asked not to come to the workplace, particularly in government workplaces. They have been asked to stay at home um, in, uh, until a certain date. They've also been, uh, there was a decree that was um, announced that women cannot be in high positions in the government. Um, they cannot be ministers uh, and in high positions. So those sorts of things um, have been very disturbing. Uh, there's also been night killings in Afghanistan that have been very disturbing. Um, and the interactions you can see ha have been disturbing in Afghanistan. So I just wanted to end on that note. It almost feels like we've come full circle. Um, and unfortunately we don't have a very happy uh, picture to end with, but um, this is where I'd like to stop and be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Palvasha, for that heart-wrenching uh, closing note. I think we are all aware and we are all in this process of the withdrawal of the troops and the effect it has on our communities at the moment. I wanted to begin to uh, with saying that I was also part of witnessing when the war started in Afghanistan and the regions that you mentioned around Peshawar and the refugee camps that my family also belongs in that region and I as a child witnessed all um, Afghans coming into Pakistan and housed into these tent villages and how you know those villages then became semi-permanent structures and the issues that permeated the society that existed in Pakistan at that time and the wrongs and the rights that were made at that moment. And now we see them at a global level. Speaking to the global sort of effect, um, I'm gonna pose the first question while I wait for the audience to put their questions in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of the screen, was how do you view um, a lot of Americans talk about allyship with Afghan women. Have you seen any specific allyship that has helped the Afghan women? Are there any models, anything that you think that needs to be invoked at the moment to help provide support? Um, anything that you might have seen globally, not just in the American perspective, but also um, how can allies help at the moment? Yeah, thank you, Luna. Um, one of the things that I uh, also had on my slides that I was hoping to get to, but I, I saw time wasn't permissible to talk about it, was also the development of the international jihadi movement that led to a lot of the extremism um, that turned into the Taliban that I witnessed while I was actually um, in Peshawar growing up there at that time. Um, but in terms of the question that you asked, uh, in terms of allyship or how to support women in Afghanistan at this point. Um, so the Taliban government seemed to really want the international community support and are seeking the international community support and recognition. At the same time, um, they also need money in order to run the country and everything right now seems to be blocked in terms of the money coming into the country. So it seems that there's quite a lot of leverage to be had um, in terms of both 
saying that if there are certain things done, uh, that uh, the money would flow, and also if there are certain things done, uh, that they would they would get international recognition. Um, so having a joint government, having an inclusive government, having a government that includes women, um, passing policies that are inclusive of women's rights, all of those, if they're clearly defined and are connected to very specific actionable items would be able to ensure um, women's protections and ensure uh, women's rights in Afghanistan. Um, instead of whitewashing it and saying, oh, everything is fine, it's not as bad as what everybody paints and not acknowledging that people are being killed and not acknowledging the suffering that is ongoing, not acknowledging that the government that has been proposed is a very exclusive government and did not meet all of the criteria for an inclusive government. That is, has been very problematic. And it seems to just be letting the Taliban do what they wanna do instead of um, really be, being clear and sending a clear message that things need to change and that there's expectation that, there, that change should come. Uh, and that with those changes, there will be um, things that will, international community will do differently with the, with the joint government. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Um, within your position, what has been your biggest achievement regarding women's rights? How do you position from where you were as a student, as you mentioned at Harvard, and then coming into this position, having lived in Afghanistan and outside, what do you think are your biggest achievements at the moment? Well, it's hard to say that with how things have changed that anything that I've done has had an impact. You know, it's really difficult to measure impact. But one of the things that I really uh, was passionate about and saw that there, there was a difference that uh, was made was in some of the work that I did at the Asia Foundation, particularly when I was working with religious actors on women's rights issues. So we're, I was uh, working with a team where we developed booklets on women's rights in Islam. Mm -hmm. And then we worked with um, what we called the male gatekeepers. So those that were the men in the communities the sh that made the decisions in the shores and the jirgas, the local community development councils, local councils, um, we worked on training them on women's rights in Islam, and we had, it was the mullahs and the imams that were giving the training. And mm -hmm. it was very effective in giving that kind of training, so much so that instead of having the eight to 10 people we were applying to train, there were more than 60 people who wanted to come and crowd into those rooms to receive that training and not just receive that training, but bring cases from their communities and ask how they should go about and resolving those cases. So in that sense, it had a quite a big impact in terms of people wanting to know more and then changing the outcomes of a lot of decisions there in a lot of people's lives, a lot of women's lives. Mm -hmm. uh, we started documenting it much later because originally it was set up as a training and not as um, a, a conflict resolution or um, having any kind of outcome on cases. And so later on, we decided to change our monitoring and evaluation to be able to capture some of the cases. And out of, there were 50 cases within a one year period that we, that we were able to monitor, 50 cases of weddings that were stopped because they were being told that the girl is the girl's choice and she does not want to move forward with this. So no forced marriage is allowed according to Islam. And they would actually stop the wedding from happening. 50 yeah. cases of those. Um, there was issues related to women's inheritance, related to divorce, related to child custody. But you know, a lot of those, um, there were over 365 cases that were documented around some of those general themes. But some of these things just really stick with you. Like, you know, a specific divorce case where it was really, really difficult, but um, the because of the conversations that they had through these trainings and through these conversations, they were able, the community was able to allow, uh, to work towards getting a woman uh, divorced. Um, and you know, things like that where um, those individual cases that I really feel that through the work that I've done, I've had that kind of an impact at the local level. Now, whether that's sustainable or not is a big question, 
Um, I, I don't know what's happened after that program. I don't know where they've gone. I know there has been demand for those booklets. Um, I know that even Oloma councils, local Oloma councils in the different provinces has asked for some of those booklets after we left and for um, some sort of programming around them. Mm -hmm. So there seems to have been a demand, but I don't know uh, how far at this point um, things are being affected. But at least at, those, at that time, those lives were impacted. No, and that seems and sounds like the grassroots movement need needed to change minds from, you know, if, as you exist in different cultures, you cannot have a top down approach, it is more bringing in the change in the minds and the way they look at things that kind of brings us to um, a question in 2018 we had uh, invited a researcher, Valerie Hudson, to be a guest speaker, who said while placing women in positions of power is a step in the right direction. However, more needs to be done in the household with husbands and fathers supporting women. Can you, as you are with your experience, speak about this idea as it relates to women in Afghanistan and women around the world? For sure. Um, no, we totally agree with that. Uh, in 2007 and 2008, we saw in Afghanistan, there were so many cases of self-emulation where women and girls were actually putting themselves on fire. They knew their rights. They knew what they wanted, but they were not being allowed to access those rights. And so what we saw was, you know, women were being educated about their rights, but the community that was enabling in the community were not being educated and not opening those gates and not opening those doors. And so that's why we were focusing actually on what we call the gatekeepers, the male gatekeepers in the community. Um, but another uh, project that uh, we've worked on when I was, since I've been with USIP is on peaceful masculinity. So it, it particularly was targeting in Afghanistan, but then it was also Tupamundu, which has done work all around the world um, on this, uh, on promoting peaceful masculinities among young men. Mm. Um, there has been a movement in Afghanistan uh, to, uh, towards supporting women's rights in Afghanistan. The peaceful masculinities took it a little bit farther where they actually analyzed um, their own constraints and expectations. What does it mean? What does a man box mean for them? What does it mean for them to be a man in that society? And sort of deconstruct that and understand the kind of roles and the implications and expectations that they have that are related to violence or related to gender relationships that they have. Um, and so we were able to not just do, you know, a limited amount of train, uh, training, we actually uh, developed this model where we trained trainers and then trained others. So uh, it was able to, to develop exponentially across Afghanistan. Um, so uh, definitely agree that that's, that's needed. Um, the other piece to the work that I was doing with the Asia Foundation was that we were, we were starting to get into um, boys madrasas. So it wasn't just the men who were the decision makers, but we we're also trying to educate the young boys in the madrasas on women's rights according to Islam. And so um, that was also trying to shift the mindset uh, and understand uh, the roles and also protections uh, for women uh, that are afforded within Islam given that framework, but then also according to Afghan laws. Thank you once again. I see uh, three different questions. So I'm going to go as I see them coming in. Uh, the first question is from an anonymous attendee. How, why do you think are women able to make a difference in situations like Afghanistan and other countries you have researched? So what we're, we're researching why women are effective. That's uh, something that we're looking at. But what so far we've found is that women have this unique role. Um, oftentimes, uh, women are not the ones who are fighting. Uh, when they come from a religious perspective, when they come from um, being recognized as pious women or being recognized as a religious woman, they also are considered to be uh, coming to the, uh, the peace building space uh, with a higher calling, with a moral background and not coming to it because they have some sort of a political agenda. Um, and it seems that women are more respected in that space and have that leeway more than men. The other is that um, we talk about women's invisibility, 
that they're able to cross boundaries because they're not seen as a threat. And so they're able to cross into spaces to build peace across borders because they have that level of invisibility that they're able, they have that, people have that sense, well, you know, they're not a threat. So I'll let that person, that woman in, and then she can talk to the other side in a way and have access that in a way that men don't have access to the other side. And so women in, in those ways um, have been able to cross boundaries, have been able to speak um, to uh, armed actors uh, because uh, of that perception of women. Um, on top of that, the role that religious women have, and also we've noticed um, even uh, older women in the community have, is how they build relationships with the people that they're speaking to. So sometimes they will work within traditional value frameworks and say, I'm like your mother. And so treat me with respect of your mother. You're like a son to me, even though it's, they're from the opposite side, they're from the warring side. And through that language and through that framework, they're able to establish a connection of trust and develop um, a, a, a level of values uh, where they can start from a value-based conversation and then build on those values to bring about um, some change related to peace and stability for their community. And so women are uniquely positioned in that way to be able to call you know, the other their son, to be able to call themselves a mother, and to be able to invoke some of those very traditional uh, roles uh, in order to bring about that, that trusted space and, 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 and be able to, to get to that level where they can then resolve a conflict. Thank you. Um, I do have two more questions. We have about five minutes left in the Q&A. So if you in the audience, if anybody still has a questions, please put it in and I'll try to get them to Palvasha as fast as possible. The next question is from Gary. We often hear about religion as a driver of conflict rather than a vehicle to resolve or transform conflict. It seems that you've had a lot of experience with religion as an essential piece of the conflict resolution puzzle. Can you speak more about this? So uh, religion definitely, uh, you know, has that aspect of being a, a divider, a uh, driver of conflict. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that is one of the reasons why it is important to engage with religious uh, institutions, religious actors, um, because they could also be spoilers in a peace building um, situation as well as being resources for peace building. And so we always talk about how even when there isn't a religious a dimension to the conflict, it's important to include uh, religious leaders, religious actors, religious institutions in the re resolution of the conflict because not only will they bring some level of moral authority, but also they could become spoilers uh, to a peace process if they're not brought in and there's not ownership into the process. Um, uh, I think that, you know, there's, um, there's so many examples, it's hard for me to even think about where, where to start, but, you know, looking very specifically at the example, uh, that we have in front of us now with the Taliban, uh, you know, if in the bond process in 2001, they were included, I think we would be in a very different place. Um, there are many, many, many times when the Taliban could have been included in a conversation and we wouldn't be at this place right now. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, although there have been attempts to bridge the gap by having religious actors on both sides of the Taliban and um, the former government side talk to each other, uh, there really was not enough effort made early on to really start uh, to work together um, and, and bridge that gap uh, in bringing together the religious voices for peace on both sides. And they did exist on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're still seeing that there are some voices for peace um, on the Taliban side, and that really should be encouraged uh, to, to foster uh, peace building and inclusive government. Um, so we have yet to see whether there will be ways for the international community to foster some of those voices and empower some of those voices to move forward. I think um, I actually have a question from Brecken in the chat, but uh, the question uh, that sort of came in 
just before that was from Brian. Uh, he, Brian has been a member of UCCD and one of the most amazing interfaith um, uh, leading voices in Utah. Uh, Kibla Ayath of University of Peshawar visited Salt Lake City on a couple of different occasions as part of the International Visitor Program. Are you familiar with his work in trying to moderate violent teachings in the madrasas of Pakistan? Can you comment on the success of his work or other similar work you might be familiar with? And is it helpful regarding the rights of women? And Palosha, I have two more questions for you, so <laughs> in yeah. <two> minutes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I haven't uh, engaged with Kiblayat myself. I do know of some of the work that is being done um, by friends in uh, Pakistan. Um, there are various levels of effectiveness to the work that's being done. I know that it's a lot of tolerance teaching that's happening um, at various levels. Uh, it's hard to talk about. Um, I think there are some attempts uh, that have been effective. Um, at, at, at uh, uh, deprogramming some of the violent extremists, particularly those that are young in Pakistan that we've been learning from. Um, we've also been working with counterparts in Pakistan to learn from some of their efforts um, on countering violent extremism. And also we're trying to partner in terms of uh, thinking through ways that uh, ulama or religious leaders in Pakistan um, uh, can help um, with the situation in Afghanistan as well because of the relationships and the influence that they might have in that uh, circumstance. So not all efforts have been successful. I'm not aware of Kiblayat's uh, work, but I do know that there have been some successful uh, efforts in Pakistan that we're working on uh, building on those successes. Um, did you wanna ask the next two questions together maybe? Sure. Um, uh, what are the, some of the successful examples of negotiating or actions that women are doing now in Liberia and Nigeria with violent extremists and corrupt governments? That's the first question. And then the last question is, what is the main question we should be asking ourselves moving forward to establish international peace? Wow, those are two really big questions. I could do a whole other presentation on Liberia and Nigeria. <laughs> Um, I, you know, um, Khadija, I can give you examples of what some of the work that Khadija was doing and also Alice, um, who was one of our researchers um, in Nigeria. These women have been actually going um, to tribal, rural tribal areas in Nigeria and working with tribal elders to build peace, um, particularly in areas on the border uh, where there are conflicts between the North and the South, between Muslims and Christians. Um, they've been going and having conversations, hosting conversations, uh, mediating conversations between tribal elders, mostly male tribal elders, um, to have local peace settlements, because it's not just the national level where there seems to be some sort of a unified government at some level. It's the local levels that really make a difference. And so they've been working at the local levels and they've done some successful peace agreements at the local level. Um, yeah, with I, I remember, Alice was saying, I sat down with 12 tribal elders in one place and we started with telling stories. And it was stories that have, you know, it's not stories about a specific thing. It's more stories that have a moral to them that, you know, that give a, an example of what they're trying to get at. Um, and she said, we would talk about these stories that were getting towards uh, what we we're trying to achieve in, ter in terms of our vision for peace and our common vision for peace. Um, so I know that, that these women have been very effective at those local levels. Um, and then the last question about the international community. Um, um, can you repeat the question just to remind me? Yeah, what, um, oops, I lost the question in the Q&A. Is it, what is the main question we should be asking ourselves moving yes. forward to establish international yeah. peace? It's, okay. Thank you. Um, that's a really big question <laughs> in terms of, uh, I think we should all be asking ourselves, what are we doing for peace? And how, us at the individual level, but also as uh, part of the United States, uh, what is our role in international peace and what can we be doing to bring, a more, bring about a more peaceful world. 
um, the efforts of the local citizens in the United States have a huge impact um, on the world. And I think that uh, oftentimes we as Americans don't recognize the impact that we can have on the rest of the world, depending on how we are able to advocate through our Congress um, and through our government, the kinds of actions that they do, holding them accountable and also pushing for specific, specific policies to build peace around the world. So it takes all of us to do those actions locally, to advocate locally for change that can happen glo globally. Thank you so much, Palvasha. I'm going to hand it over to Dion, um, but my personal thanks for you uh, to take all these questions and provide us perspective that we really need at this moment. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lunajan. It's been wonderful to talk to you today.